Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you to Critical Race Theory uh, in the law school for inviting me, although I was you know, moaning to myself that I should not have accepted because I can't really say anything authoritatively about the Trump regime. Uh, and so I'm obliged to kind of go back to my own work, which is what Noah asked us to do, to, to think about uh, what, where do I think I am right now. Um, it doesn't really doesn't, um, it, it's a good thing perhaps that all the panelists that have preceded me have, have virtually said everything I want to say, but it's worth saying again so that we could, we could have this, this conversation. So as Noah said, I've only recently come to the United States, and when I studied white nationalism before, I did so with a focus on Canada, although white nationalism, Canadian white nationalism, is, was never simply a domestic project, product, and neither is white nationalism here. But with the election of Donald Trump and the, the installation in the White House of several people with really overt uh, strong white supremacist inclinations, I drew uh, a lot of sympathy from my Canadian colleagues who said, you know, you picked absolutely the worst time to go to the United States. Um, but they actually, they got a lot more, uh, a lot less smug in, in their remarks to me when about three hours after the Trump travel ban, a Canadian white nationalist walked into a mosque in Quebec City and uh, killed six people. And so the man's Facebook page indicated that he had followed and adored Trump, finding in him a confirmation of his own long-standing white supremacist dreams. Uh, his name is Alexandre Bissonnette, and he apparently held very strong anti-immigration, anti-feminist, and pro-Israel views. And he seemed to have turned to white nationalism after uh, Marine Le Pen, the leader of France's far-right movement, visited Quebec City. So as a Francophone, Bissonnette would have found very easy access to France's own brand of white nationalism, one that is rooted, as Cheryl noted, in that country's colonial history and its encounter with Muslim populations. So Bissonnette seems to have understood himself as part of a global white supremacist movement. And there's every indication that he was actually formed by narratives that are internationally organized in scope. So I want to use these 10 minutes, and I saw Cheryl having to go fast, so I'll have to go even faster. <laughs> I want to use this 10 mi minutes to talk about white nationalism as a global project anchored, to be sure, in very specific place-based nationalisms, but really tethered together by a kind of globalized white supremacy. And if anyone has studied it, it is really surprising how much the circuits of communication are connected um, so that uh, people read the same things and can express the same views everywhere. So uh, it, it's pretty obvious, and many people have pointed this out, that that this kind of globalized white supremacy is a racial formation that began in colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade. Remember that by 1920, Europe laid claim to three quarters of the globe, and the settler colo colonies had already begun to firmly establish themselves along explicitly racial lines. So this racial project of accumulation, as several people have said, continues today, and when we track it, right up into its present neoliberal incarnations, what we find are the same racial subjects across space and time. So in answer to, to Noah's question about you know, what's really changed here, we have to start that answer, and I don't, I don't really have an answer, but we have to start by saying 100 times over uh, that this uh, project of accumulation has always been globally organized. Colonialism crosses borders, and it requires a white subject that is similarly global in scope. And so when you know, many ra radical black scholars, many critical scholars of colonialism stress the kind of global underpinnings of, of white supremacy and talk about, for example, the way in which uh, Du Bois, to think of Du Bois again, uh, slavery was the foundation of capitalism, we're really sort of talking about the way in which economic Capitalism as we know it, in all of its manifestations, really requires racism. So that's a pretty obvious point. 
But I want to go to Du Bois for an insight that I really want to emphasize today, just from the basis of my own work. If you know, the transatlantic slave trade introduced new and absolute notions of difference, tethered to projects of accumulation. Colonialism did the same thing. But Du Bois further argued that the slave trade produced what he called the discovery of personal whiteness, where Europeans began to understand themselves as human only relative to black people as, a be as beasts of burden. So I'm, I'm very interested in personal whiteness because I think that's what we really have to think about here. I think it's really likely that the Canadian killer of Muslims that I mentioned possessed and nurtured a fair share of personal whiteness, a quality that has to be shored up again and again through acts of racial violence. And when I think about personal whiteness, I think the question that I really want to ask is, how is it secured through racial violence? And to understand the process as deeply historical and deeply psychically structured. And those are the two things that I kind of want to always keep in mind. And so, um, if you go back, again, to go back to du, du Bois and you, you, you share his emphasis of empire alongside of enslavement and realize that the whole project depends on the theft of indigenous land and the disposability of indigenous and black bodies, if you go uh, that way, what you understand is what, what uh, Walter Johnson in a recent article uh, emphasized was the spatial aspect of capitalism that you see in Du Bois. Uh, he gives the example of Du Bois connecting dead elephants whose teeth were required to make piano keys to the people who play the piano. <laughs> um, and sort of uh, advising, uh, reminding us that Imperial London could not exist without dead elephants. Neither could it exist without the slaves. And, and uh, that if one, hap if one noticed the blood on the piano keys, then the cultivation of a personal whiteness was absolutely necessary for elites and non-elites because something has to resolve the terrible violence that, provide, that makes this relationship. When I want to consider personal whiteness today because of the time I want to think about masculinity, uh, and it, you know, the picture reminds me that I, we have to think about femininity too, but that's another talk. Uh, so, uh, so when we think of the masculine subject who is generated by these racial projects of accumulation and who um, is required for them, we need to think of white men roaming the world and to think about their, the cultivation of personal whiteness that crosses borders. I had asked for the, the Kipling's old poem to be put up there, but, but we don't actually need it. Kipling is a good place to start. He wrote The White Man's Burden for personal whiteness. Because when you look at that poem, you realize, and that poem was, you know, has been called a hymn to, to uh, US imperialism. It, 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 that poem really indicates sort of the, the early contours of this kind of global white subject. The white subject who is a man and who's being asked to take up the burden of empire by veiling the threat of terror and checking the show of pride. And the poem reminds white, white men that disciplining and keeping in line people of color domestically and internationally is what white manhood is all about. And this is a bit of a cliche, uh, the poem is a bit of a cliche at this point, but it's a really good reminder. It's also a good reminder because it, it presents white manhood as a kind of humanitarian project, that you're, you're actually going to go do this because you need to save the world. And so if we think of those aspects of the global white subject, if I take you on a very quick historical journey, uh, I want to emphasize how racial violence really makes this global white subject making racially structured accumulation possible across Western nations. So if I take you even uh, to 1993, when Canadian peacekeepers went to Somalia on a peacekeeping mission and tortured Somalis. So ca Canada had its Abu Ghraib 10 years before the US had its Abu Ghraib. 
Uh, those Canadian soldiers really understood themselves and their testimonies at the National Inquiry really indicated that. They understood themselves as, as white men, and some of the peacekeepers were not white men, but they were trying to white themselves. They understood themselves as having to use force and violence to keep the natives in line, even when the mission was peacekeeping and even when the natives in question were children trying to steal food from the camps. The soldiers' sense of themselves was explicitly racial, explicitly colonial. But what is very interesting for the perspective of today is that they really saw themselves as members of a family of white nations. Canadians understand themselves as the Canadian soldiers in this moment, for example, as the younger brother of the United States. Uh, sometimes they say the hero's friend. But the idea is to emphasize that we're all part of a big family of white nations, and we have different roles depending on our, our actual nation. So Canada is a small middle power, and sometimes it likes to feel not as aggressive and brutish as its elder brother, but the point is that it's a family. So as in colonial times, a peacekeeping encounter in Africa, other peacekeepers tortured too, by the way, the Italians and so on, uh, Africa served as a resource for white identity, as a place where white men could become white men, exactly as it did 100 years earlier. And this kind of sort of pursuit of personal whiteness is very visible in, in the mythologies of the New World Order, the mythologies of the War on Terror. Uh, we're all, we have all been inducted into the idea that, that what is going on is disciplining, instructing, and keeping in line third world peoples, who, who somehow, as Kipling's poem put it, we irras who irrationally hate and wish to just destroy their saviors. We have no idea why, but that's what's happening. And so this, this kind of um, whiteness that is performed through nationalism and through national mythologies um, is, you know, comes along with a sense of one's own benevolence. I think uh, a speaker this morning, uh, Dean Segura, mentioned, you know, this pursuit of goodness, the way in which uh, these white men feel con persistently good that what they're engaged in is a project to save the world. So race is obviously crucial to this, and we see that the invitations to join these kinds of projects are always extremely racialized, as many speakers have pointed out. So as Asla went, mentioned this morning, you know, the, the war on terror, for example, is an invitation uh, to join a, a, you know, an encounter. At first it was said with absolute, uh, an encounter with evil. And the, the biblical overtones of the phrase, the Christianity of it, immediately recalls Kipling's poem once again, where we fight savage wars of peace and heathens of, a, of, a, of an, another space and time. So the Christianity of it is always there, and the, the call to sort of this Christian fraternity really provides a kind of uh, togetherness, an enabling of religion, and it promises a racial togetherness. And that, I think, is the, the thing every speaker will point to, but I really want to emphasize at this time. And this uh, racial togetherness, so citizens of nations who join the alliance against evil, come to know themselves as members of a more advanced race whose values of democracy and peace are simply not shared by others. So everyone has pointed out how values talk is really central to white supremacy, providing both a cover story for more, a more open white supremacy, but also a storyline that those who understand themselves acting in, the, in, in white supremacist ways are really bearing the white man's burden. And so we could watch uh, in this respect for positions such as we will only ban those Muslims who refuse to integrate and share our values, uh, which is a line coming from Donald Trump, but certainly has come from every Western leader in the past since 9-11, since, uh, uh, but well before that as well. And so these kinds of mythologies, white mythologies, are, are and apocalyptic encounters between good and evil are very hard to resist. And I, I want to just end then by, by going back to some old work and talking about how myths work in this respect. So they work along very old historical tracks. 
So as Richard Slotkin wrote in 1973, myths actually take a phrase like absolute evil and evoke a kind of complex system of historical association. So when John F. Kennedy came to California shortly after his inauguration, he, he said that he was, um, he, he used the idea of the frontier to mark himself as a president able to fight communism abroad. And so what is immediately sort of marshaled is that old encounter between cowboys and Indians and the undeniable civilization and victory of one and the savagery of the other. So, uh, you know, and this story sort of goes on in, in various incarnations, but in the 1990s, the story began to pick up steam that the West had become so civilized and it thought it was already beyond, uh, you know, having to, to think about um, sort of uh, nationalisms. It thought it had entered this, this new moment of peace. And, and suddenly, out of nowhere, came warlords and ethnic nationalisms. They've sprung out of the ground. We don't know why they've, they've, they've come into being. But we civilized white men must try our best to civilize others, even as they keep trying to uh, go down the path of ethnic nationalisms. And you'll find scholars like Michael Ignatieff uncritically taking this up and actually saying, that's where we are in the 1990s. We're disappointed white people who, you know, who, 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 are, who are confronting the, these, peop these uh, evil people. It, it is not an understatement to say that this appeals, uh, it, 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 it's, we should stress that this appeals to a deeply racially inflected memory. It is not at all surprising that American soldiers in Vietnam, Canadian peacekeepers in Somalia, both described where they were as Indian country. To be invited into this fantasy is to be invited into a fraternity. Those men who are not of Indian country, but who are uniquely fit to sort it out. This is why I think the abuse of women is so central to the making of this fraternity. Now, in, in her book, Manless and, Manliness and Civilization, Gail Betterman explores the way in which whiteness became a manly ideal in the 19th century. Male power, she theorized, was always linked to the notion of civilization. Civilized white men were thought to have a racial genius for self-government. And in the words of President Theodore Roosevelt, a manly duty to destroy and uplift lesser primitive men for their own good and the good of civilization. Uh, Donna Nelson points out that white male power was negotiated through imaginary and actual relationships to Indians. Men's longing to be a part of a civic brotherhood and to an imagined fraternity of white nations required perpetual engagement with the racial other. It is this same engagement with the racial other that characterizes today's relationships. Today, the fraternity has to be performed before the media. Perhaps we see some of it in the Trump-Putin uh, relationship. The international must be depicted as a place where white men with guns and drones must civilize racial others, just as the national is the space of civilizing internal raci racial others. And all of this is best done with one's shirt off. As, as uh, <laughs> The, the power of this story and its psychic appeal comes from the mythology that informs our history. And let me leave you with, with Slotkin's uh, reminder that the real founding fathers are not the politicians who drafted the Constitution, but rather those who tore violently a nation from the implacable and opulent wilderness, the rogues, the adventurers, the land boomers, the Indian fighters, the traders, the missionaries, the explorers, the hunters. If you think of these figures, Slotkin reminds us, then you understand that, the, the, that these, when these mythological figures take over national politics, you have to recognize what the game is here. Slotkin discusses such American moments in the 19th century as moments when the national aspiration became defined as so many bears destroyed, so, man, so much land preempted, so many trees hacked down, so many Indians and Mexicans dead in the dust. In the 20th century, national politics is dominated by the same figures 
we can now say with certainty that so many Indians and Mexicans dead in the dust remains key to the making of the nation and to the making of white subjects. Today's white nationalists are really kin to Slotkin's Indian fighters. And his memorable book title, Regeneration Through Violence, should remind us that such figures regenerate through violence. There's one last thought to share with you. Imagine for a moment soldiers who feel themselves surrounded by savages, as the Canadian peacekeepers did. Imagine the heady feeling of bringing civilization to the masses and the national imperative to keep the natives in line. Imagine the fear of being overcome by blackness and imagine what is needed to dissolve that fear. The German scholar Klaus Thevelite wrote of the fascist who survives his own fears by beating others to the pulp he threatens to become. The violence dissolves the threat of engulfment the fascist feels from the alien race and from women. The recording of the violence also tells the men and women who record it as nothing else can, that they have survived an encounter with savages, that they have remained hard, organized, phallic bodies and male egos, even when female. It is the body that has to express these racial arrangements. Words will not do the trick alone. So when Canadian soldiers on peacekeeping missions and American soldiers at Abu Ghraib posed for trophy photos, as German fascists did before the Second World War, they preserved for posterity their moment of superiority and crucially control. Photos, Patricia Vettelbecker reminds us, are hard items that will not fail. They hold out the promise of continual erection. We might think of the body expressing the racial arrangements of today and consider what are some of the hard items that will not fail. Walls and bands perhaps are like ho photos. They hold out the promise of a continual erection. Thanks. <laughs>